Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner, and we're covering an introduction to thermal physics by Daniel V. Shorter. And this is section 1.5 compression work. And you can think of this as my open notebook or a lecture on the, the text at hand here. Anyway, compression work. Uh, well, now, he's going to talk about more than one type of work you can do on a gas or that a, um, a, or any kind of substance, actually, and what that substance might be able to do on the environment around it. But the most typical form of work that you do on a gas is you compress it. So we're going to talk about compression work. Okay. Now, keep in mind that according to classical uh, physics, you know, Newtonian mechanics and everything, the work is equal to the force vector dot some direction of motion of that force vector. We're talking about particles here, not about entire systems. The issue is when you calculate the work, you need to apply this for every single particle in the system. And so if you're thinking of a, a system as a bunch of particles, perhaps you could find a particular point that would represent the average of all the particles or something like that. Okay. So in thermodynamics, we, we have a little bit of a problem because we can't really use a center of mass. And the way he resolves this problem is, first of all, is he says we're going to have a piston. Right? So we're going to have a cylinder, and then we're going to have a piston here, and we're going to apply a force to that piston, and it will change the volume of the gas inside and the pressure. Okay? Now, if we can exclude all of the friction and everything else that might be happening besides the work done on the gas, then we can find the work done on the gas, and we're going to find that the work done on the gas is equal to the force on the piston times the change in the position of that piston, okay? Because we're talking about pressure and we have a piston, the force on the piston is actually equal to the pressure of the gas times the area of the piston. And so we can replace this formula with the work is equal to the pressure times the area of the piston times the change of position of that piston, okay? Now, at this point, he introduces a new term. It's called quasi-static. And what quasi-static means is that we're applying the changes relatively slowly to the gas. The exact measure of how slow we need to be is actually, in experimentation, not really that important. As long as you're going slower than the speed of sound in the gas, you should be fine. If you look at this formula here, you'll notice that the area of the piston times the change in the position, that's just the change in volume. So if we rewrite this as work is the pressure, times the change of volume of the gas. And since the volume is decreasing, the gas's volume is decreasing, we're going to change that sign to a minus sign. So work is minus the pressure times the change in the volume. He gives a quick example here in the book. He says we have a tank of air at atmospheric pressure, which is 10 to the fifth Newton meters squared. And if we were to reduce the volume, so we're going to change the volume by um, a very small amount, 10 to the minus 3 meter cube, 1 liter, I think that is. Okay, so we're reducing the volume by 1 liter. We have, to, and we maintain the constant pressures. The pressure doesn't change as we do this. Then the work done on the gas, which is just the pressure times the change in the volume, is going to be 100 joules. So 10 to the minus third times 10 to the fifth, that's just 100 joules. Okay, so that's 100 joules of work to change the volume of that gas without increasing the pressure. Now, usually when you compress a gas, the pressure will increase. That's just common sense. That's what you'll understand. And your inclination is going to be to apply calculus to it. So you have, let's say we have a graph over here. Here's the volume. Here's the pressure. And as you decrease the volume, the pressure goes up, right? And so you can divide this up into tiny slices, and next thing you know, we're doing calculus. And so the area under the curve here becomes the work done on the gas. So when there's a change in volume of the gas, there's the work done on the gas. And if you're moving this direction, if you're going uphill, if you're going from a large volume to a small volume, the change in volume is negative, so the work is increasing. If you're going the opposite direction, then the volume is going from a small value to a large value, which makes it positive, so the work is decreasing. Okay, so when you're going this direction on the graph, you're doing work on the gas. The gas is increasing in internal energy. And when you're going this direction on the graph, there's work being done on the environment around it, and so there's energy leaving the system through work.
If we can find a function for the pressure, depending on the volume, then we can rewrite this as minus the integral from the initial volume to the fo final volume of the pressure over some small slice of dv. And this is for quasi-static. Again, we're not, we're not rapidly changing the volume, so much so that it's comparable to the speed of sound in the, in the volume. One of the confusions people have is they see this and they think this is the end all story of all the work that, we can, that can be done on a gas. This is not the case whatsoever. There's other kinds of work that you can do. This is just one of the types of work. Problem 131 is a good problem. It's an interesting problem. It took me a while to really understand what the point of the problem was, but this is the problem. So if we have a volume of helium gas and it starts at uh, one atmosphere pressure at one liter. So we have one liter here, and we have one atmosphere here. And then we triple the, we triple the volume, so now we're at three liters. And the pressure increases proportionally. So now the pressure is up here at three atmospheres. That's what that means. So we've somehow gone from here to here. So the, v, the initial volume is here, the final volume is here. Okay. Now, keep in mind that according to our formula, the work done is going to be minus the integral from the initial volume to the final volume of the pressure as it relates to the volume times the slice of volume, right? Now the volume's increasing, right? So the change in volume is positive, which means that there is work leaving the gas somehow, okay? So this is an interesting problem um, to figure out, especially part E, where it says, what might you do to cause the pressure to rise as the helium expands? Now. When you consider the internal energy of helium, you have to remember there's two things that contribute to that energy. And I'm not gonna say much more than that, but there's two things that you can change in this formula, PV equals NKT, that, can, that have to adjust when, if you want the volume to increase and the pressure to increase. So one of them is slightly obvious what you have to do, and the other one is slightly less obvious. Okay, that's an interesting problem to play with. Problem 132. This one, you're going to draw a graph of what it looks like to go from two, to go from one atmosphere to 200 atmospheres. And let's say from one unit, let's say one liter of water down to 0 0.99 liters of water. That's what it means, 99% of its original volume. So if you draw that graph, you might see something that maybe it may or may not be surprising. And obviously you can't graph this to scale. You have to adjust the scale somehow to make it fit on your piece of paper. Problem 133 is getting you thinking about engines, okay? And I gave you a general rule that if you have volume and you have pressure, and if the volume's increasing, or the, then, then that means that there is work leaving the system, that the, the internal energy is decreasing. If the volume is decreasing, then the internal energy is increasing. Okay, so as, as you see these graphs, so one graph does a triangle like this, where it goes up, it goes down to the left, and then it goes to the right. The other graph does something similar, but it goes like the opposite direction. So it goes down, it goes to the right in a rectangle, it goes up, and it goes to the left. The right is a rectangle, okay? And these processes, there's a different amount of work for each of these legs of the journey, and you'll have to calculate, at least graphically or, or uh, intuitively, which one is producing positive work net, or which one is producing negative net work. Problem 134 takes what we learned about heat and work in the last section and applies it to these particles here, these, these uh, gases here. And in the first part, we're going to see that there's a change in the energy due to heat. There must be heat flowing one direction or the other. And in the, second, in the second part, part B, it's going to ask you to think about each of these steps, like what is actually happening to the pressure, volume, and temperature. And in the final one, you're going to look at the entire processes altogether, everything to do with everything. And you should be able to find simple rules or words for everyday objects that you know of that behave like this. We'll continue the, with the next video on the next part of this section compression of an ideal gas. Have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.